The coefficient of determination measures the strength of a relationship between variables. And remember that the closer it is to 1, the, which is the perfect, 1 is all the ducks are in a row, the better it is, right? The stronger the relationship. Okay, so let's look at this example. As part of a larger study, Speed and Gangestad from 1997 collected ratings and nominations on a number of characteristics for 66 fraternity men and from their fellow um, fraternity members. The following paragraph is taken from the results section of their paper. So it says, men's romantic popularity correlated with several characteristics, most outgoing, which had R squared of 0.47, best dressed, which had R squared of 0.48, most physically attractive, which is 0.43, and most self-confident, which is R squared equals 0.44, and funniest, which was R squared equals 0.37. Unexpectedly, however, men's potential for financial success did not significantly correlate with their romantic popularity. Okay, so first question, which trait from this study appeared to have the strongest correlation or strongest relationship with romantic success? That would very obviously be the best dressed, right? Because best dressed has the highest correlation coefficient out, or excuse me, coefficient of determination out there followed very closely by most outgoing, right? How willing you are to get out there and talk to other people. Although you'll notice that it is a moderate strength relationship. It was the highest value out there. Now, why does the study say that financial success was not significant? That's because the R squared value for financial success is so low. Um, perhaps lower than one might have originally thought. And that's because, well, it can be what it is, but, but what's happening is that's causing us to have a not significant relationship. And that's because the R squared equals 0.1 is so close to no relationship at all. A 0.09 is the mark for no relation, and we're very close to that mark. So there we say it. So it had a very low R squared value of only 0.10, which was very weak and close to the no relation mark of 0.09. All right, so now that we know how to interpret the R-squared value, it would be important for us to be able to find the R-squared value. So we have our data set from before where we had the free reduced lunch for 13 schools and the percent of those students in those schools that passed the state math exam in Ohio. And we want to find the coefficient of determination. So I'm going to grab my calculator, go to Stat, go to Edit. Oh, hey, my data is already in there. Great. So the way to find the R-squared value is to run the linear regression function just like we have before. So you're going to have x list is L1, y list is L2. If you like, for whatever reason, you can store your regression equation. Um, you don't have to though. If you want to, you'd hit variables, go to the right to y variables, number one function, number one. But again, this is not necessary. You don't have to do that part. You do have to do the x list and the y list. Go down to calculate and press enter. And the R squared value, you can see it's the third line or fourth line down. It says R squared equals 0.473. So there you have it. It's as simple as that. We're not going to find it um, any other way. We're not going to do it by hand. Also remember it has no units. There's no uh, percentages or feet or inches or anything like that. It just is what it is. Wonderful. Okay, so now let's go back and look at our fertility rate and life expectancy yet again. So here we have it. So these are the births per woman as our explanatory variable, and our response variable was the life expectancy. Now you'll notice that Excel actually gives R squared. So the coefficient of determination is given to us right in the problem. It tells us that it is uh, 0.5189 which for the record would be 51.89% if you want to write it as a percentage. All right, now we want to compute the correlation coefficient from that given information. Well, that gets interesting. So the thing is that r is the square root of r squared. However, that doesn't guarantee the sign of r. In algebra, we learn that when you take the square root of both sides, you have to put in a plus or minus. So r could be positive or r could be negative, and the r squared would still end up being positive. So that means I need to take the plus or minus square root of my 0 0.5189. I have to choose whichever one's appropriate for my data set. So 
Obviously, it's not both positive and negative. It's going to be only one or the other of them. But I first need to find what that number is. So to take a square root, I hit second square root, which is above the x squared button. And I type 0 0.5189. And I get 0 0.7203. So that is what my R is going to be. It's going to be either positive or negative 0 0.7203. It's not both of them. It's one or the other. So then I have to look at my data set or, and my uh, scatter plot, or both, whichever one was given. Or another way to look at it is the slope. Do you see the slope is a negative? That's a sign, right, that the, the R is going to be negative. Or you can look at the graph and see that it's going to be negative. It's a negative relationship. And because our slope is negative and you can see the negative relationship in the scatter plot, we are going to choose the negative value. So we choose whichever one is appropriate for our data set. It's not going to be both plus and minus. That's incorrect. So, but it's one or the other. And you choose the correct one based on your actual problem. I just make a note of that right there. So we choose the correct sign from the graph or the slope or both. All right, now interpreting the R squared is the uh, phrase that was given to us when we first in were introduced to R squared, which is right here, that we use R squared percent of the total variation in, quote, Y, end quote, which we will explain that in context. We're not going to leave a letter like that. Um, is explained by the least squares regression line. So that leads us to this interpretation. 51.89% of the total variation in the life expectancy from country to country, in other words, the Y variable. So I'm explaining the Y right there with context. Right? In context. Is explained by the least squares regression line, or the line of best fit, or whatever you want to call it. So we can use the line to explain about 52% of the variability from country to country. Why do some countries have people living longer than others? Well, 52% of that variability I can explain with an align through um, or utilizing the fertility rate. But that means that 42% of it or so, I'm not really sure why it's happening. It's because of other variables. Speaking of other variables, Let's look at this politician. So a politician from another country sees, sees this data um, and results from life expectancy and fertility rates. She determines that to get a longer life expectancy in her country, she should just restrict the number of children to one per woman. That's it. We're just going to make it so everybody has one per woman. What's wrong with that reasoning? Well, she's inferring a causal relationship between fertility and life expectancy. Right? She's implying somehow that if she lowers the fertility then perfectly, automatically, just like an algebra class, the life expectancy will go up. But of course that's not really how this works. right? It's not that if you um, make a dictate from on high that you're going to have one child per woman that perfectly, automatically, the life expectancy will go up. It doesn't work like that. There are other things that are going on. So let's start off with what's wrong with her reasoning. So she's inferring a causal relationship between fertility and life expectancy. right? She's implying that one thing will automatically change the other. That's how algebra works. That's not how statistics works. Not unless you have a designed experiment, which we do not have. All right, so this is our old classic, a very important phrase to learn and know which is that when you have observational studies, not designed experiments, remember designed experiments imply randomization, right? which we can't do. We can't randomly assign fertility rates to different countries. So if you're just looking at observational studies, then there could be other things affecting what's going on. right? Correlation that you find, which we found a decent correlation. By the way, this is um, moderate, right? So just so you know, that's a moderate negative correlation. But just finding that moderate, moderate negative correlation is not enough to prove causation. right? Correlation is not causation, not for uh, observational studies. And that's because of lurking variables that are things that are in the background that are affecting both the fertility rate and the life expectancy. Now that's a key, right? A lurking variable, a true lurking variable will affect both of these and make the whole thing go wonky on us. So we have to think about 
from country to country, why would some countries have higher fertility rate and life expectancy, and some countries have lower, or excuse me, higher life expectancy, lower fertility rate, and then some countries have high fertility and low life expectancy? Well, there's a lot of reasons why that might be, but some of the big ones you could think of might be healthcare, infrastructure, things like that. Infrastructure is a big one. It's one of my favorite topics. So that's like um, when you turn on a switch in your house, do you take for granted that it, electricity will come on, that you have a working power grid, that you have building codes that are strong, that you have uh, running water that's safe to drink, you know, those kinds of things. Healthcare spending, for example. How much does your country spend on healthcare? How much does it spend on prescription costs? How much do you pay to educate doctors? How well educated is your populace, etc.? There, there's hosts and hosts of lurking variables that make it so that some countries would have a higher life expectancy and some countries would have a lower life expectancy. But it's not just the fertility that causes it. The fertility and the, the life expectancy go together hand in hand with these other variables. Right? Countries that have a lot of infrastructure, for example, tend to have lower fertility, higher life expectancy. Countries where education, in particular of women, because women are the ones that are having the children. So if women are more educated, they tend to have less kids, tend to wait longer to have their first child, etc. And of course, this is a very important topic that's come up before in Chapter 4. It also came up in Section 1.2, and I can almost guarantee it will be on the final. This is a big deal to understand because you'll have to be able to apply this reasoning to sociology classes, social science classes, other science classes, etc. So it's very important that you understand all the pieces of this. Just one of these pieces is not enough. You can't just say correlation is not causation. You have to say why it's not because of lurking variables, because you're looking at an observational study, and then what are some potential lurking variables for your situation. You don't need three of them, you just need one good one.